Hey everyone, God bless you and thanks a lot for tuning in. I have a reflection today that I have entitled Metropolitan Philip, rest in peace. Before I make this uh, reflection upon uh, the legacy of His Eminence Metropolitan Philip, whose 10 year anniversary of repose is today, he fell asleep in the Lord on March the 19th, 2014, and today is March the 19th, 2024. It's a wonderful time to uh, offer thanks uh, for his life and in to introduce him to you if you don't really know him, because he is a very significant uh, archbishop that God gave to us here in America, and his legacy is profound and ought not be forgotten, but built upon. But before I say a few words about Metropolitan Philip, uh, allow me to encourage you, since the fast has begun, I have my wonderful little coffee mug, but poop, there's nothing in it, <laughs> because this is Pure Tuesday, uh, and we aren't uh, eating and drinking yet, those of us who are capable and are strong enough to do so. I wish you a very fruitful Lent, and I would like to encourage you to use your Lent wisely. The church teaches us how to fast through her sacred services. She sets forth a vision of fasting, and one of the constant themes uh, of this preceding week leading up to the launch of the fast yesterday is to greet the fast with joy, with rejoicing and anticipation, and to make the most of the fast to deepen your love for God, to renew your spirit, and to do good to your neighbor. So I'm suggesting some ideas to make the fast substantial. You know, not eating without praying and doing good deeds, works of mercy, is no fast at all. So infuse your time, focus your efforts on doing good. And you may be thinking, well, what good should I be doing? I'd like to encourage you to attend the services, the Lenten services, faithfully at your church to see if there's anyone that you could bring to church. Maybe shut-ins need a ride. Maybe young people need encouragement and you can take them. How about visiting a prisoner or writing to one? And if you don't have any friends or family or acquaintances who are in prison that you could visit or write to, why not contact the Orthodox Prison Ministry, OPM, and see if uh, you can participate in their national ministry to prisoners. Decide now who would benefit from the money that you're going to save by your fasting. It's quite easy to eat simple in Lent and to save half of your food budget. So no, no matter you're poor or rich, you're able to give substantial contributions to those who have nothing. Who are you going to serve? Decide now because it will greatly help you keep the fast. What about opening your home to strangers and bringing them out in? Show hospitality and let people that have never been in your home come into your home and taste a little bit of the love that you have to offer. What about visiting cemeteries and praying for the departed? What about sending charity to one of our missionaries? What about def definitively ending a riff, smoothing over something uh, with anyone that you've had problems with in the past before the riff ends you? Just end the riff. What about visiting your grandparents if you're blessed enough to have them? These are just some ideas. I'm sure if you just take a few minutes, you can come up with a lot more beautiful ideas to make Lent truly the springtime of the soul. All right. Today, we remember uh, the life of His Eminence Metropolitan Philip Saliba, who served the Antiochian Orthodox Christian Archdiocese here in America from 1966 when he was elected Archbishop of New York Metropolitan of North America until 2014. Can you imagine? Almost 48 years uh, as Metropolitan here. He fell asleep in the Lord today, 10 years ago, and he is quite missed. He is quite missed. I'd like to share a little bit of his uh, biography with you and then some a few personal reflections and mostly focus on how I uh, perceive the significance of his legacy. He was born on June the 10th, 1931 in Abu Mizan in Lebanon, a small village in Lebanon, in a beautiful family of a loving father and mother. He was one of four brothers and he had a sister. I think there were five kids total. 
He entered the Balaman Seminary in the first post-war class in 1945. It had been shut down during World War II. He also studied in Homs, Syria. He was ordained deacon on the Feast of Transfiguration, August the 6th in 1949 at the age of 19. The next month, he became the secretary to Patriarch Alexander III in Damascus. In September of 1952, he became the dean of students at the Balamont, and he went to study abroad in England in 1953. In 1956, he came to America to study at Holy Cross Greek Orthodox Theological Seminary just outside of Boston in Brookline. He was not happy there because uh, it was in Greek, and uh, he didn't come to America to study theology in Greek, he said. He could have done that. Actually, he was offered to study in Athens and Thessalonica, and he wanted to come to the West. He wanted to come to America and study in English. So he moved to Detroit, and he entered Wayne State University there, doing a degree in history. He was attached uh, to St. George Church there in Detroit as the deacon, and he became involved uh, in uh, this, at this period, in the, the late 50s, in the local Orthodox Christians or Orthodox Christian Fellowship, the University Orthodox Christian Fellowship at Wayne State, which had, get this, about 200 active participants. I know that uh, that could shock many Orthodox young people today who are in college, who are involved in OCFs across the country in smaller numbers. But just in Wayne State, 200 uh, students. And what do you know? Uh, Philip, Deacon Philip, was a president. Uh, his last year and was the president of OCF and rejoiced in the incredible uh, collection of American Orthodox from every kind of background at the university. This would be uh, an appreciation that in his life and ministry would only grow as he embraced the, the pan-Orthodox reality of America, the cosmopolitan nature of Orthodox Christianity in America, which he championed his whole life. On March the 1st, 1959, he was ordained priest by Metropolitan Anthony Bashir, the Metropolitan of the Antiochian Archdiocese at that time, and was assigned to pastor St. George Church in Cleveland. Go St. George. In June of 1965, he completed an MDiv at St. Vladimir's Theological Seminary, where he studied under uh, the late and great uh, Father John Meindorf and Father Alexander Schmemann. As a matter of fact, he delivered the sermon at Father Alexander Schmemann's funeral some years later, about 18 years later. On the 16th of March, 1966, he was nominated by the Archdiocese here to succeed uh, the late Metropolitan Anthony Bashir, who had fallen asleep uh, in the Lord. On the 5th of August, 1966, some five months later, he was finally elected by the Holy Synod of Antioch to be our Archbishop. There was uh, quite a delay and dragging of the feet by the Holy Synod that wasn't cons quite uh, certain yet that this young 35-year-old uh, in America should be the Archbishop. But after we sent a massive delegation there, finally he was elected by the Holy Synod in August and consecrated at St. Elias Monastery in Lebanon, which is a monastery that he was very familiar with since it was very near his home village and he used to spend all the feasts there. He was consecrated on the 14th of August, 1966, as uh, Archbishop of New York Metropolitan of North America for the Antiochian Archdiocese. He was enthroned at our cathedral, St. Nicholas Cathedral in Bro Brooklyn, on the 13th of October, and he began an almost 48-year ministry tenure, full of vision and full of accomplishment for the glory of God. Let me list some of uh, his major accomplishments. In 1968, he established Teen Soyo. This is our Society of Orthodox Youth Organizations, teen groups in parishes across the country, calling them to study the Holy Scriptures and the writings of the Holy Fathers and encouraging them in their local conferences. These local Soyo conferences ended up becoming what we call today parish life conferences, local diocesan conferences that unite uh, the Orthodox in each particular region of the country. In December of 1971, he moved our archdiocesan headquarters from uh, an insufficient home in Brooklyn to a very majestic estate in Inglewood, New Jersey, where it continues to be our headquarters to this day. In July of 1973, he established the Antiochian Women and Archdiocesan-wide fellowship and philanthropic organization involving all the women of the churches, which uh, have been, uh, what can I say, a, a major powerhouse for philanthropy 
uh, and for fellowship all of these years since their founding in 1973. In June of 1975, he ended the division between the two Antiochian jurisdictions in this country that had been going on since the 1930s. And through an agreement with uh, the late Archbishop Michael Shaheen, uh, these groups were brought together. Metropolitan Philip became the metropolitan of both groups, establishing one united uh, Antiochian Orthodox Archdiocese of North America. And Archbishop Michael Shaheen became his second. In July of 1975, just a month after ending this division, he established the Orthodox or the Order of St. Ignatius of Antioch. The Order of St. Ignatius of Antioch is a philanthropical organization of donors from all over the country uh, that make a regular contribution uh, to the church for major projects, educational projects, supporting the youth, camp building projects, all sorts of things. Uh, as a little side note, uh, the Order of St. Ignatius supports our own Orthodox school here at our parish just as an example of one of their many good deeds. In March of 1978, March 31st, 1978, he created the Antiochian Village Retreat Center, would become the Antiochian Retreat Center, uh, Conference Center as well, and camp in Ligonier, Pennsylvania. It had been, it's a massive multi-hundred acre camp that had been a Presbyterian camp uh, that was purchased at this time, made into the Antiochian Village, and it has become uh, a great center for uh, service to the youth, gatherings of the clergy and lay people from all jurisdictions who utilize the Antiochian village in Ligonier, Pennsylvania, a wonderful place. He was awarded honorary doctorates from his alma maters, first from Wayne State University in 1980 and then from St. Vladimir Seminary in 1981. He coagulated the Orthodox bishops in America together to the glory of God uh, at Ligonier in 1994 uh, and issued the incredible uh, Ligonier statements uh, 30 years ago. God being my hel helper, I'll, I'll share more later this year uh, with you about that. It was a historic moment in the church. He built up the local diocese within the archdiocese, first with Bishop Antoon becoming a bishop, and then with uh, Bishop Basil becoming a bishop. Eventually, there was uh, a, a diocesan-wide, he created a diocesan-wide structure with numerous diocesan bishops uh, on his uh, metropolitanate, blessed by the Holy Synod of Antioch under the leadership of Patriarch Ignatius IV, such that we, he secured self-rule for the Antiochian Archdiocese here in America. He grew the number of our churches from 60 churches with about 86 clergy when he became Metropolitan in 1966 to something like 300 churches with around 450 clergy uh, by the time of his repose. He declared 1978 to be the year of mission Starting with, he said, a mission to our hearts. We have to be converted ourselves every day if we're going to uh, convert the United States, which was his great ambition. And I'll say more about uh, that in a second. These are some of his major accomplishments. And did I fail to mention that he suffered numerous heart attacks as early as when he was in his 30s and recovered and pushed through them with God's help? Yes. An amazing life. An amazing life. Please allow me to say a few personal words. This is something, a meal type uh, reflection that I'm making. And usually the Mercy Meals are where people can share personal reminiscences. I'd just like to share a few. I was taught to love Metropolitan Philip by my own spiritual father, His Grace Bishop Basil, who worked closely himself, worked closely with Metropolitan Philip for most of Metropolitan Philip's life, beginning in the early 1970s, just when uh, Bishop Basil got out of seminary at St. Vlad's. My first but lasting impressions uh, of Metropolitan Philip happened just after I went to my first clergy gathering, uh, clergy symposium. I was ordained in 1993, and in 1994 I went to uh, the first of the clergy symposia. and have been going ever since, every two years. He had an incredible presence. You knew when he walked into the room, it was as though all of the air was sucked out of the room. He hadn't even spoken yet the first time I saw him. He, just walking into the room uh, made me stop. He was extremely charismatic. He valued words extremely highly. He was a poet and loved poetry. And he crafted his speeches to the clergy and to the faithful with great care. They were weighty. They dripped uh, with substance. I owe him... Uh, 
a great debt. He accepted me and my family into Holy Orthodoxy in 1993. He oversaw our catechism and appointed our catechist, the late Father Michael Trigg, God rest his soul. He accepted me for an ordination and accepted my mission church uh, into the church. He sent His Grace Bishop Basil uh, to receive my family and my people into Holy Orthodoxy and then to ordain us. He assigned me uh, five years after that, that was 1993, and on May 1st of 1998, Metropolitan Philip assigned me to my pastorate here at St. Andrew Church. Let me tell you, disappointing him was a frightful thing. I did it once or twice uh, over the course of my pastorate, and it was always uh, deeply grievous. He protected my pastorate when I was young and supported me at very crucial moments uh, where things could have gone off the rails. He encouraged me in my academic studies when I proposed to him to uh, start a doctoral program. Certainly from his end, it it must have been been strange when I had children already and was uh, already working in the pastorate. He supported us. He supported when I took my wife and seven children to England to complete my studies and to take a sabbatical. He has been consistently, he had been consistently an incredible supporter of theological education uh, throughout the archdiocese, with clergy and lay people. And our theological programs and the number of our young people going to seminary was something that uh, greatly increased uh, under Metropolitan Philip. And perhaps most important in my life was his uh, incredible support and a very precious letter that he wrote to me and to our parish uh, while we were building our church temple uh, back in the, the, around 2009, 2010, leading up to the consecration of our church, December 3rd, 2011, he sent an incredible letter about the significance of church temples uh, and the right of church consecration and uh, mission, our mission to uh, this community. It has never left my mind or my heart, uh, his incredible support for the, the church. Now, saying those few personal things, let me leave the personal realm and end my reflection by a few words about how I see his legacy and his great significance. Why I think he was such a successful metropolitan and won so many non-Orthodox Christian clergy to Holy Orthodoxy and so many people to the faith. Let me start and build up here. First, he loved the United States. He came here as an immigrant, but he didn't come here to use the United States. He came here uh, as a humble uh, person who respected the United States greatly. And this is a huge difference with regards to immigrants. Some immigrants come here to take only. Others come because they deeply respect the United States and the, the contributions that the United States has brought to the world and its history. And Metropolitan Philip was one of those. As a young American, not yet Orthodox, finding out about Metropolitan Philip and looking into Metropolitan Philip, I found that he was a devotee of the Founding Fathers of the United States. He read the Founding Fathers. He quoted them extensively. He believed in the American experiment. He loved the United States Constitution. Uh, He recognized and, and respected the fact that constitutions were bulwarks against tyranny. And he believed that even in the ecclesial realm, our monasteries and patriarchates and dioceses, they all have constitutions. This is not some American thing. Constitutions are very ancient with regards to the, the practice of the church. And he championed parish constitutions. He uh, helped establish proper uh, canonical order in the churches, both empowering uh, priests to function as pastors and encouraging the lay people in their participation. He despised clericalism and wanted uh, all the Orthodox people to follow the Ignatian model. Bishop, priests, deacons, and people constitute the church, working together. That's a quote from Metropolitan Philip. He used to love to emphasize St. Ignatius of Antioch's guidance, especially the, the words to collaborate together, working together for the glory of God and the advancement of the church. He was a person, though, of Arab background. He didn't just love Arabs was a champion for the Middle East, absolutely, and he championed the cause uh, of the Middle East in America constantly at the highest levels of the State Department and in the White House. But he loved the United States and he loved Americans. He loved what we were. He loved our cosmopolitan nature. 
and you cannot save what you do not love. Many people wonder why it is that uh, Metropolitan Philip was able to save so many Americans and bring so many people into the church. Well, one of the most obvious reasons is that he loved Americans. He didn't just plug his nose here uh, and, and not celebrate America's history because of this or that current um, problem with America. No, no nation is without its foibles. He certainly celebrated our 4th of July's and, and celebrated uh, the national glories of America. He also despised nationalism and philatism and spoke against it as a heresy. He thought the ethnic jurisdictions in America were complete, a complete betrayal of holy orthodoxy. And this, uh, as, as he championed a single American United Orthodox Church, was a, a great, of course, vision that was given to Americans. Americans uh, are in, in becoming some other nationality. And that's the message, of course, that he said so many Orthodox churches promoted by emphasizing their language over English and by always putting their ethnic titles in their uh, ethnic descriptions in their titles on their signs, which is just a message to America saying, hey, if you're not that, we don't want you. This is not for you. Philip recognized that and opposed it. And the result was an explosion of Orthodox converts. So he loved the USA. He also despised an, what he called an upstairs, downstairs uh, Orthodox spirituality, a spirituality that was content to be in the walls of the church and to have magnificent prayer services, but wasn't engaged in society, in charity and witness and cultural leaders constantly. He would even bring them to our conventions. He met with numerous presidents of the United States over a very multi-decade period of time. He met with presidents, vice presidents. He met with presidents of the United Nations. He was constantly bringing uh, the witness of the Orthodox faith uh, to the country and to its leadership. He was zealously anti-communist and spoke about the evils of atheism and communism constantly uh, leading up to the fall of communism in 1991. He was also a great lover of all Orthodox, zealously pan-Orthodox. Uh, he made pilgrimage during his, his metropolitanate to Russia, a, a, a grand pilgrimage, and upon his return, hymned the glories of the Russian church, hymned the magnificence of their services and of their uh, hymnody, especially of Slavic hymnody. To love both Byzantine music and Slavic music is a, a unique uh, tradition of the Antiochian Orthodox Archdiocese here in America. May it always remain. He was a leader uh, in the Pan-Orthodox movement under Skoba. He was the vice chairman under Skoba under Archbishop Yakovos, who was the leading bishop in America, the uh, Archbishop of the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of America. They, Archbishop Yakovos and Metropolitan Philip, worked hand in hand for decades together, drawing Orthodox churches together here in America. He was faithful in our Orthodox ecclesiology during a period of uh, the rise of the heresy of ecumenism, he walked a very straight line. He was in no way a ecumenist. He was very much of an anti-ecumenist. He believed in the orthodox teaching of the church, that the church, orthodox church, is the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. At the same time, he loved non-orthodox Christians of all sorts and collaborated as much as he could uh, with non-orthodox uh, while being very faithful, very much in the tradition of St. Raphael of Brooklyn, who had many, many contacts in the non-orthodox Christian world laboring uh, as he could there, but was also very faithful uh, in Orthodox ecclesiology. He was dedicated to evangelism. He wanted all of North America come home to the faith of Saints Peter and Paul. It's a famous quote from Metropolitan Philip that he made on numerous occasions, uh, speaking to the press, speaking on television, speaking to groups that would come and see him, uh, calling uh, all Americans to the faith of Saints Peter and Paul, to the faith once delivered to the saints. He received many, many converts uh, into the church. Famously, he received the, the evangelicals in 1987, several thousand uh, together with their clergy. He catechized them and received them uh, at different places of lo geographic locations across the United States in a huge wave. Um, he received large numbers of convert clergy from Roman Catholicism, Anglicanism, Lutheranism, ordaining them all, by the way. I told you he was not an ecumenist. He ordained them all and didn't recognize any of their ordinations, but recognized their, their training, their sincere uh, Christian commitment 
and cultivated them and brought them into the church. He also, if the clergy were seminary trained and if they were pastoring whole communities and those whole communities wanted to go through catechism together, he oversaw their catechism and received them in as groups, maintaining their integrity, receiving them all into orthodoxy, uh, and then ordaining their clergy and helping them at, along as new uh, convert congregations uh, as a whole. In fact, uh, my parish, uh, back in 1996, uh, participated under Metropolitan Philip in doing just that for our daughter church, St. Peter, uh, which is in uh, Pomona. And we saw that through from beginning to end. Uh, and they have been now for many, many years, a fa almost 30 years, a faithful Orthodox community. He uh, took major heat. Metropolitan Philip took major heat from many bishops uh, uh, across the United States for being this uh, condescending, this helpful uh, to, uh, to whole communities. He was viciously criticized for doing it, but I think his, his courage and his actions have proven authentic and true. He's been proven correct over time because the vast majority, vast, vast majority of these groups have proved to be faithful clergy and communities for all of these decades. There's certainly a distinction <laughs> between apostolic succession and apostolic success. All of our bishops who are rightfully ordained, of course, have apostolic succession, but that doesn't mean that they're going to have apostolic success if they don't have a missionary spirit and aren't willing to take risk and be faithful and move into places of discomfort in order to help people become orthodox. His ev evangelical mind, his heart of evangelism and for preaching the gospel and helping people be reconciled to the church show showed itself here locally in Southern California by the fact that he, he started many churches here and he, all, he insisted always that the names of the churches be fundamental Christian saints, um, not saints that would be unfamiliar or unrecognizable to Americans. So for instance... I'm speaking to you from St. Andrew. Our mother church, which is in Garden Grove, is St. Luke. Another church that St. Luke started in Torrance, St. Matthew. Another church started in Irvine under Metropolitan Philip. St. Mark, you're getting the picture? <laughs> Luke, Matthew, Peter, Andrew, Mark. All the apostles, all known to Americans to help bridge the gap between them uh, and the Orthodox Church. He was also... Uh, radically committed in his evangelism to the use of the English language. He published our, our prayer books in English. We have the fantastic liturgicon that he blessed His Grace Bishop Basil to put together over the course of years, which is the premier English language uh, prayer book uh, in America. Philip supported and promoted the Kazan Music Project, which was an incredible English Byzantine music pro project, harmonizing Byzantine music uh, beautifully with a Western musical notation and helping people to seek, sing Byzantine music together while supporting the traditional Slavic music in English uh, in our uh, liturgical tradition here in America, which is Metropolitan Philip. He called the Slavic music incomparable, just incomparable. He loved it so much. He supported all sorts of print and digital outreach, supporting and starting conciliar press in the archdiocese what became Ancient Faith Radio and Ancient Faith Press. He supported missions by highlighting the work of evangelism every time the church got together in our biannual archdiocesan conventions. In our general assemblies, the heads of all of the ministry departments, of course, would report, but he would always leave a very special place and a very special amount of time to the work of the Department of Missions and Evangelism. And the late Father Peter Gilquist would get up at these conferences and on the big screen would put a map of the United States and he would have different color coding and little circles where uh, new uh, missions were being considered, where missions were past the consideration point and had become mission stations and then where those mission stations had had uh, enough converts to establish a full mission church that was even given a name and had clergy visiting it regularly. And then those mission churches that would become churches. And every two years, we would just be in, in amazed and our jaws would just be on the table as we saw more and more 
uh, mission stations starting, more mission stations becoming mission churches, more mission churches becoming full-fledged churches as the faith was growing and prospering across the land. This is one of the greatest legacies of Metropolitan Philip was his supreme concern with bringing the faith uh, to the American land because he loved it, he wanted to save it and build bridges between uh, Americans and Orthodox Americans. Lastly, I would say his legacy is also profound, though it has been trampled on in the dust. Trampled on in the dust. Uh, his legacy is also profound in his quest for the unity of the Orthodox Church in America. Metropolitan Philip is duly respected and famous for his uh, zealous desire to bring, to put an end to the philatistic existence of ethnic jurisdictions in America. The fact that when most Americans think of orthodoxy, they think of foreigners is a terrible disgrace when orthodoxy has been in this country active for more than 200 years. And to listen to the excuses made by our leadership over and over again to justify our sins is something that Metropolitan Philip could not stand. And he called it out and he opposed it constantly. He did this uh, very effectively with the support of two patriarchs of Antioch who came here uh, at Metropolitan Philip's invitation with whom he was very close. The first was Patriarch Elias IV, someone uh, deeply loved uh, and respected throughout our patriarchate, who came here and with Metropolitan Philip traveled throughout the whole uh, archdiocese, speaking everywhere and calling for the unity of the church, for the formation of one American Orthodox Church. Patriarch El Elias was a zealot for this and called upon us to execute this and supported Metropolitan Philip to do it. Philip would eventually bring Metrop our Patriarch Ignatius IV also here to America. And Patriarch Ignatius IV was also the great scholar that he was, was very articulate in arguing for one united American Orthodox Church here. Uh, in fact, he championed it at numerous venues and in many ways. I was able to hear this uh, myself uh, in a visit that I had with Patriarch Ignatius in 2010 at the Patriarchal Headquarters in Damascus, where he explained to me his vision for and his, his desire for uh, three uh, autocephalous churches in America, a Canadian Orthodox Church, an American Orthodox Church, and a... Uh, uh, Mexican Orthodox Church or South American uh, or Central American Church, not just Mexican. Anyway, he had an incredible vision and Metropolitan Philip, of course, hosted these uh, esteemed patriarchs and ga gave them venues for articulating this vision across the country from east to west. Metropolitan Philip himself gave a loud bullhorn to leaders to speak about this, and himself was the most articulate. He constantly promoted the English language as the universal language of the church, the necessary language for all Orthodox jurisdictions in the church. All other languages, he said, should be used only for pastoral needs uh, where it was really necessary. They should not be sustained uh, in America since the normal, normative language should be English if we hope to win the country. During his tenure, we, he led in the passage of numerous archdiocesan-wide resolutions at our conventions every other year. We called for the formation, the immediate formation of a united Orthodox Church. Now, of course, we hear of nothing. And since his repose, we've heard of nothing. He gave an, an incredible speech that launched uh, an aggressive promotion of the unity of Orthodoxy in America that culminated in 1994 under his leadership. He gave this speech at a Sunday of Orthodoxy gathering at the Greek Orthodox Cathedral of the Holy Trinity in New York City, 1977, in which he called on America to transform SCOBA, the Standing Conference of Orthodox Bishops in America. This was the predecessor to the uh, Assembly of Orthodox Bishops in America. He called on SCOBA to be transformed into an autonomous Orthodox Church in America. 
quote, our overlapping jurisdictions fundamentally contradict our canonical and ecclesiological teachings. Here he's saying that this isn't just something that we should do. It's something that we must do, and because we are not doing it, we are violating the sacred canons of the church, we are disobedient to the Holy Fathers, and we are also violating our ecclesiological teachings. We're being, in fact, heretical. This is what his point. He actually used that word. He said to maintain this tradition that we have here is heresy. This is uh, to quote Metropolitan Philip. It's a key, of course, he said, to our witness. Is it any wonder that he was such a successful evangelist and that he so faithfully and successfully won people to the Orthodox Church when he cared about granting to American Orthodox Christians what all other Orthodox Christians have, and that is uh, a, an authentic local church, not broken up into all these uh, hideous divisions? No, I don't think it's an irony or an accident of history that the man who was champion Orthodox unity won so many Americans to Orthodoxy. In his words, to settle for less is heresy, quote unquote. This effort to bring unity to the Orthodox Church in America culminated in the Ligonier meeting, which was a massive triumph of Metropolitan Philip's vision that he hosted himself at the Antiochian village in 1994. If you don't know about that, uh, look it up, or uh, perhaps I'll be able to speak about that at another time. Metropolitan Philip is very famous for a statement that he uh, co-opted from President Ronald Reagan when he would be pushing for uh, the accomplishment of good deeds amongst the people, and especially for Orthodox unity in America. He was quoted as saying this, if not you, who? And if not now, when? If it's not you who are, who are, who are, who's going to bring this to pop about in your part of the world, then who? And if it's not to be done now, even though we know it's God's will, when? When should it be done? I used to love to wait for that quote to come out because he used it in many venues. What a legacy. What a champion. It is the case that in uh, Metropolitan Phillips last years, he made some mistakes which cost him and the Archdiocese dearly, no doubt about it. I have no interest in talking about those things. Uh, I'm remembering all of the incredible, beautiful things. Metropolitan Philip had spoke, spoke many on many occasions that he wanted bishops to retire at the age of 75 and that he fully was resolved to doing that. He wasn't able, for reasons that I don't understand or know, uh, to do so uh, and uh, I think if he had retired at 75 when he said that he was going to and he wanted to, probably right now we would be participating in uh, his glorification campaign. That's my guess. What a legacy. May the things that Metropolitan Philip was inspired to do and faithfully accomplished in this country May they be cherished by all of his children, his spiritual children, and may they be admired by all Orthodox Christians in America and other Christians also. And may they be imitated and zealously brought to new heights uh, in the future, to the glory of the Holy Trinity and to the magnificence of Orthodoxy in America. God be with you. Patristic Nectar Publications is pleased to announce a new conference entitled The Sacred Arts preaching the gospel without words, with lectures given by Father Maximus Konstas and Jonathan Pajot. From Friday, March 29th to Sunday, March 31st, conference topics will include the origin of sacred art, how iconography preaches the gospel, how to read an icon, how architecture preaches the gospel, how music preaches the gospel, and a sermon by Father Maximus. We hope you will join us for opportunities to pray meet our speakers, attend a young adult social hour, and network with like-minded individuals. A $60 registration fee includes an in-person seat, access to a live stream which can be viewed from anywhere, and the conference recordings. To register and find more information, please visit conference.patristicnectar.org.